stop for it, and it would gain infinite mass. And since that's why light particles can go light speed, because they don't have any mass, they don't gain any mass. They're very mysterious. And um, it's interesting, then what? The discovery of the speed of light and working with light and meditating on it does to cosmology. It simply blows the roof off the universe, and people begin, the physicists and astrophysicists begin to speculate on the Big Bang and the nature of the universe and the speed of light. They begin, based on that speed of light, to begin sort of carving out the structure of the cosmos. You have to realize how fast light goes. It's 186,000 miles a second, and it covers 6 trillion miles in a year. That's a light year. One year, 6 trillion miles. Well, the Milky Way galaxy, which is comprised of about 100 billion suns, is about 100,000 light years across. 100,000 light years across. Our own solar system is about 30,000 light years off the center or the periphery, I forget. And um, that simply re renders absurd any notion of the resurrection of Christ's body. Because even going at light speed, which is impossible for a physical body, and the notion in the Christian tradition is on the resurrection of the physical body, not the subtle body, even traveling at light speed for 2,000 years, he wouldn't be out of the galaxy yet. He might have gone to other solar systems. The nearest solar system is, is Alpha Centauri. It's four and a half light years away. But he wouldn't be out of the Milky Way. So that, the cosmology there of Einsteinian relativity has just simply demolished the biblical vision of the universe. It doesn't work. You can't fit it in anywhere. And then that's special relativity. And then uh, the general relativity that comes in about 1911, 1912 simply displaces Newton's vision of gravity. And he sort of um, goes out of the philosophy of force to a kind of substance philosophy and says, well, all time and space is a kind of unified mass energy field, and planets are like bowling balls in rubber sheets, and space is warped by the, by the mass of objects. It's the mass of objects that cause gravitation, because gravitation is like uh, if you were to roll a marble on a rubber sheet around a bowling ball that's sunken into it, uh, the sunken space around it is what accounts. It it's almost a kind of reversion to a substance philosophy. I mean, what the hell is curved space? Nobody knows. We can picture it geometrically, but we, nobody knows exactly how that works. But it's a theory that makes better predictions and accounts for the phenomena than does the Newtonian mechanics, so everyone uses that now. And I suspect it's still, uh, there are all kinds of uh, problems that are unsolved. Yes? Uh, if you don't mind, another aside. Um, there is a Marxist author, who works his name I don't remember now, uh, who is taking the uncertainty principle to test the mathematician and philosophy, yes. saying that, well, Okay, Heisenberg showed that we cannot measure them both at the same time, but that doesn't mean they don't both exist. Sure. But the thing is that I think a flaw in his reasoning <coughs> was that he was then departing from the empirical principle. He was then saying that, well, we can't demonstrate, we can't measure, but by faith in our Newtonian physics, right. we believe that they exist as separate uh, quantities. Yes. Interesting. So that's, that's uh, anyhow, that's, that's where we're at. And um, actually, a whole new world is opening up now. Ever since uh, the Einsteinian revolution, and Einstein, about the same time that Einstein is working all this out, Jung is working out his vision. And so now we come back full circle to where we started. Um, Jung and Einstein had a number of dinner conversations. They both had a mutual friend. They were both living in uh, Zurich. This was right around 1911, just uh, about the time Freud and Jung were beginning to have a falling out. And uh, Einstein would come over, and Jung later wrote of it. He said, Einstein was often at my house, and uh, he would explain the theory of relativity to me, but he had the worst uh, trouble doing it because I'm not gifted in mathematics, and you should have seen all the trouble the poor man had to go through to explain relativity to me. But he says, well, there came a point where I began to explain psychology to him, and then I had my revenge on him. And so you get this sort of impression of these two titanic egos battling against each other. And they're not really communicating. Neither one really understands what's going on in the other sphere. But it's ironic because both men are engaged in a total demolition of the mechanistic vision of the cosmos. One in physics, the other in psychology. Jung is busy working out the theory of the collective unconscious that uh, begins to dismantle the Freudian mechanistic theory of the psyche. And so from that point on, new worlds have been opening up. And the book that I wrote, uh, Twilight of the Clockwork God, that was based on a series of interviews with scientists today who are drawing great inspiration from mythology in their work, are simply sort of turning everything about the other way. And we have seen what I've just illustrated uh, is the sort of demolition of mythology, the biblical mythology and the anima mundi, by the revolutions of science. But now we're seeing that science is beginning to be absorbed by mythology. Mythology is impacting science now and transforming what is coming up. 
because many of the scientists who have been coming of age since the 60s uh, grew up in an environment that was very, that was popularized by the work of Carl Jung and Joseph Campbell. And Campbell was out floating around with all these people. And um, they began to draw great inspiration from the world's esoteric traditions. Uh, Rupert Sheldrake is a, my favorite example. Um, for example, he went <clears throat> to live in an ashram in India. And while living there, he was a biologist. He evolved the theory of morphogenetic fields, which is really the return of the anima mundi, the re-ensouling of the world. He does it sort of playing the game of science. And what morphogenetic fields are is a sort of cosmic memory that is spread all throughout. I mean, that's right there. How can an object have memory? Well, he sort of um, spreads the concept of memory from the human mind to everything. And he says, well, through the principle of morphic resonance, like forms resonate with other like forms. And that resonance is what gives them their structural stability. And it's very much like cosmic memory. Um, for example, if you set up a, a resonance in a tuning fork, and you bring in another one that's the exact same size and shape as the first one, and the resonance will automatically start up in the second one. They're in resonance with each other. Uh, there was this problem long known in physics about um, clocks with pendulums. You could set them uh, swinging with discordant pendulums, and gradually they will move in phase until the pendulums are swinging together. And there are these kind of mechanical explanations about, well, one clock is sort of sending oscillations through the wall to the other clock. Um, but this could be looked at from Sheldrake's point of view as the two are in resonance. And I'm told that women traveling or living together for long periods of time will experience synchronization of their menstrual cycles. Well, why is that? There again, you have the theory of morphic resonance. Like forms resonate with like forms. Well, Sheldrake worked out you know, this theory in the context of biology to try to explain why it is that species remain constant over time rather than what Darwin predicts. Darwin's theory predicts that <clears throat> if natural mutation is ongoing, constant, random, and happening all the time, we should have far less uniformity among species than we do, and there should be far more anomalies, mutations, and uh, creatures that don't work. There should be a lot more experimentation going on than we actually do find. And the fossil record never supported Darwin's theory, and he himself admitted this. He thought, well, we just haven't found enough fossils yet. But what the fossil record shows is enormous spans, millions and millions of years, of species existing without undergoing evolution. And if they're not undergoing evolution, they can't be spitting out mutations randomly. So what accounts for this long structural stability? I mean, uh, the coelacanth, recall, was discovered in the 1930s and was thought to have been extinct with the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. Now, this thing is a living fossil. It's still around, and it's millions of years old, and it hasn't undergone evolution at all. And it may even be related to the species of fish that we evolved from, the lungfish. It, it doesn't even have a, a spinal column. It has a primitive notochord. It hasn't even developed the vertebrae yet. And um, so when you look at the fossil record, you find stability. And since catastrophism is now coming in and displacing the geological theory of uniformitarianism, we can begin to see scenarios in, in the dinosaur, the extinction of the dinosaurs as a result of a comet coming in uh, has helped this. Um, now it's begun to be thought that species do not evolve. They try, once they have evolved a form, it stabilizes, persists over long periods of time, and will not undergo change unless something drastic happens to the environment such as a comet or a massive ecological poisoning. And it then turns out that the evolution of the species is not random at all, but is an intelligent, thought-out response by the mind of the species of how to survive to the new changes in the environment. And the species themselves do not just uh, adapt or die. They also shape the environment. They are responsible, too, for changing uh, the bacteria, for example, that emerged, that came into being, uh, from out of which all life has been built up, uh, we're talking like 2.8 billion years ago, something like that. Um, but it learned how to photosynthesize, and uh, it's the theory of Lynn Margulis that these uh, descendants of these bacteria were then taken up into plant cells and confer on plants the ability to photosynthesize, because the bacteria learned how to do it first, and they carry the chlorophyll with them into the plant. And if you remove that from the plant, it wouldn't be able to photosynthesize. But when these bacteria discovered how to photosynthesize 3 billion or so years ago, 2.8, you have to look at what does photosynthesis do. Well, it leaches, uh, it, uh, leaches carbon dioxide from the air, pulls it down, and that will cause a cooling. And it might not be coincidental that the first ice age dates from precisely this period, right in here, two billion years ago. These little tiny things may have actually brought about the, the massive global cooling. And um, then the waste product of photosynthesis is oxygen. There was no oxygen, or very little oxygen in the early atmosphere to primarily methane and CO2. But these tiny little organisms living in the ocean totally